pee when I'm excited. I didn't want to urinate in my pants. Uh, uh. <laughs> wow, it's uh, it's Tuesday. Night, I wanna folks. know. Can you show me? I want a story like Fred. He writes me. Tell you know, me more. I took a Please week off, me. and it was the most serene week I've had in months. Folks, Tuesday night, welcome to Between the Rolls. Uh, we are glad to have you. If it's your first time, welcome aboard. If you've been here before, thanks for coming back, even though Kyle's here. Follow us on Twitch. Follow Go us on to Twitter. your ear doctor. Make sure you get your hearing checked out after going deaf. <laughs> Take a look at our old. archive. Uh, if you want to shoot the shit uh, with us, check out our Discord channel. Uh, if you want to buy some of our RPG crap, uh, the stores there. Most importantly, if you want to be on the talk show or you want to be in a one shot, M Hobo Inc., Gmail, or Twitter, let us know. We will get you on there. We got a couple of one shots coming up. Uh, fortunately, after we kill Taryn in the campaign, that will end. So we'll do more one shots, followed by another campaign that Carol's not allowed to be in. Period. End of story over uh you'll notice we only have fair you're not going to have anyone else show up for the campaign though I, i've got like five <laughs> you got five i've got you're five so already <laughs> so somebody's gonna get hurt feelings taryn uh you might notice a different background uh and only three of us uh with somebody who you don't recognize until we introduce him uh hi i'm kyle and uh, <laughs> i'm happy to be talking and asking questions today and we're damn glad to have you. Uh, also with us is Mike from oddfishgames.com. That's why I didn't do the pitch. Uh, Mike is going to pitch the products all night long. Now, he does have to DM a game, so we may have to cut it a little bit short. And that means we'll have to listen to Kyle. So apologies in advance. Mike, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Howlett. Um, I am one of the... Uh, two principal uh, members of Oddfish Games, a tiny little company in southern Indiana that makes weird game stuff. Um, we started a couple years ago with a, a really oddball pro product. We decided that, you know, you, you could get sounds for role-playing games. You could get, you know, all kinds of visuals for role-playing games, lights, colored lights, you name it. But, you know, nobody really had good sense. All right, so, I'm going to stop you right there. When you say south or southern Indiana, like south of 40 Indiana? Uh, yeah. Okay, that explains it. Okay, continue. <laughs> and we, we are perilously close, uh, according to my liver, to uh, Kentucky and bourbon country. So, yes, southern Indiana. Anyway, so, yeah, we came up with, uh, we came up with a really oddball product, and that was let's create these really nasty, some of them are nasty, some of them are not so nasty, really nasty scents that game masters could use at the game table. We called them adventure scents. And, you know, we had everything from oldie crypts to putrid sewers to all kinds of fun things. And so that, that was our sort of entry point into, you know, just coming up with oddball ideas that we wanted to, you know, bring into the world. And we love them. Uh, I picked up some adventure scents uh, for these guys as well as give them away at conventions. Uh, DMs, if you're looking to reward your players, I highly recommend them. Uh, they come in a variety of sizes. I personally like the scent packs. They're about yay. But, well, you've seen them. I don't have them with me because I don't have my dice here. Right. I'm doing a Kyle. And Kyle doesn't have his. Uh, but you see us uh, smell them. I have Rowdy Tavern very close to myself and uh, Mayan Temple for date night. Uh, as he pointed out, uh, the uh, putrid sewers. I'm going to give that one to Kyle as a gift because I've smelled it before and I hate Kyle. So it's its own reward, yeah. <laughs> it is its own reward, because you can smell it right about here as you taste it going down. Uh, so uh, there it is. Uh, so DMs, if you're looking to just reward your players, he does have some good smells. Uh, he does have some bad smells, although, honestly, uh, I think I've only smelled two that were really bad. Uh, the gunpowder one's kind of cool, because... Pungent, not bad. Pungent. Not bad, pungent. pungent. Uh, but yes, today we are going to talk about the newest product 
uh, that they are kicking off called the Shine Story Engine. Uh, this is particularly ugh, particularly useful uh, for you DMs out there or uh, creative writers who are interested in how do I get my feet wet? How do I do this? What do I need to do? Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Mike with probably frequent interruptions by Kyle and I. <laughs> frequent. Uh, because, frequent. Yes. Honestly, I, did... I thought we were doing uh, Carol's Fence Post Adventure Scent. Now, They're see, not coming can, out with that yet? You can hit them up about that. You know, maybe figure that one out. Let's do that off air, though. Uh, I, I happen to pick up uh, two copies of The Shine Story because it is on sale right now. Uh, and I'm a cheap bastard. But uh, I have it. Uh, gave the other one to Kyle. We've been going over it, so we are prepared to just stick it to the man. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, uh, I'll let you go ahead and take over. Uh, tell us a little bit about, or tell us a lot about the Shine story. Tell us as much as you want about it, please. So I'm going to start off by saying that uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, it is uh, an organization that runs an event in the month of November where people around the world come together and independently attempt to write a 50,000 word novel in one month. And for those of you who haven't tried the NaNoWriMo challenge before, I highly recommend it, NaNoWriMo.org, um, National Novel Writing Month. Um, it's, a, it's incredibly difficult. Um, it teaches you a lot about like, you know, uh, writing and about yourself. And it's just, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a challenge and a half. And I discovered NaNoWriMo many years ago and I had been playing around with creating a way for me to structure my st stories when I was writing, you know, novels or short stories or whatever, structure my stories in a way so that I could make sure I didn't fall into certain like story structure pitfalls as I'm writing. Um, because I remember when I was in college, I got to th through about two thirds of the way through a novel and I realized the entire thing didn't work. It, this wasn't even a case where I could, you know, restructure this or change this part of the story. I literally had to dump the entire thing and start over. It was, it was a bit of a disaster and it was a bit of a wake up call. And so when I first discovered NaNoWriMo, I thought to myself, you know, it would be really cool for folks who are taking on this challenge of writing an entire 50,000 word novel in a month. It'd be really cool if they, if they had a method by which they could spend the month of October sort of structuring out their novel, creating an outline so that they kind of knew what they were doing the minute November 1st hit and they could get their 50,000 words in. So that was kind of the original concept behind China. And that was years ago. Um, and then about three, four years ago, we were so busy having fun with um, our two products, uh, you know, Adventure Sense and, and Cooking with Dice, that we weren't really thinking about new products. And I thought, you know, it might be cool if I take that old concept and turn it into an actual product. And I was thinking about it. I'm like, well, how would people use it? And so the original concept behind Shine is, you know how a lot of people, when they teach uh, writing, we'll talk about structuring your story out on note cards and pinning them to cork boards. So a lot of, in you know, I've hear a lot of writers rooms in, in Hollywood and stuff like that use this method, get a giant cork board or a big fat, you know, flat space, like your, your, your bed. And you basically write pieces of your story, things that need to happen, things that are critical or important. And you start putting them out, you know, on your cork board in different places. And you do the, you know, you draw strings to them or you move them around and it's a way to visually structure what's going to happen in your story. And, uh, and so I thought, okay, what if I turn these things into cards? What if I basically gave, came up with a system that helped new writers, um, understand how story structure works and be able to use those cards to write on them, pin them to a cork board and, you know, thus outline their story. That's the high level version of the cork uh, board is very important in that information there. And that, uh, Mike, that doesn't work when you're trying to put it on a whiteboard, does it? <laughs> you know, depends how big your whiteboard is. I don't know. Over here at uh, Indiana University, man, I've, there's some whiteboards in that place. They're like the size of walls. 
See, Kyle, you got a long way to go. I do. I got nine more of those to put up. Now, Mike, one of the things that you warned uh, about, uh, not really in the preface, but early on is this is not the be all end all, correct? This is just suggestions on how the easiest way oh, to yeah. So one of the things I noticed, I, I, this, I, rem I remember from my, from my college years, um, I remember discovering this um, storytelling system. And there are a lot of these out there. And there have been for years, decades. Um, and storytelling, you know, a lot of people have an idea of there's a, there's a right way to write a story. There's a right way to structure a story. It needs to have this many acts and it needs to have this many pages and it needs to have... You know, this event happens on page this, and it's, you know, very sort of concrete. And I remember finding the story structure system when I was in college, and I was like, oh, this is really cool. Because, like, you know, you look at it, you see patterns, and you're like, oh, that does work in, like, they do have that in Star Wars, and they do have that in the Die Hard movies. And so I go in and talk to my script writing teacher and was basically chewed out for nearly 10 minutes on how story structure was a myth and that this was just going to lead to formulate writing. And she's half right. One of the things that, you know, has just been an interest of mine is basically setting everybody's system of how to properly write a story. And the problem with all systems is that if you follow those rules to the letter, you will get formulate writing. And your writing will start to look you know, like every other bad movie that's ever been written or every other bad novel that's ever been written. And you Although don't want to that. be fair. <laughs> bad novels can be bestsellers or yeah. average movies like R.I.P.D. I, you know. <laughs> you know. See, Mike, that's I've the kind of crap that someone. we got to put up with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Our producer is horribly offended at this point in time. Keep going, Mike. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, the uh, so yeah, so yes, the, that teacher was correct. It does lead to formula right. So I thought to myself, okay, how do I how do I make a a writing system that's not a system? How do I make this so that people can get you know someone, especially someone who's a new writer, someone who's never done this before, has no clue what they're doing, um, which is like me every time I write. Um, how do I get it to the point where they feel confident enough in their story um, that they can go forth and write, which is a difficult thing, and not be constantly second guessing themselves without telling them specifically how to do it. So the point behind Shine is basically, look, I'm not going to tell you how to write a story because there is no one way. All I'm going to do is I'm going to isolate certain patterns, right? So stories are typically patterns of human behavior that we find interesting. And so the premise behind it is, I'm gonna introduce some patterns that commonly appear in stories and you can choose whether you wanna use it or not. And so the, when you print up the, P, if you get the PDF and you print up those cards or um, if you get our physical product, which it hasn't, hasn't been released yet, the idea is, is you're going to have these deck of cards and you're going to, and there's two sections. There's a setup section and then there's the, the four act main section. You're going to go through the setup section. You're going to be like, okay, I'm going to take my basic concept of an, of a story and I'm going to flesh it out to the point where it's kind of ready to be outlined. Um, and then you're going to take the main card and you're going to go through it one act at a time. You're going to look at the cards specifically in that act. And you're going to say, okay, One. is this something that really is a part of my story? If the answer is yes, there's text on there that um, kind of gives you an idea of how the story structure works for that particular part of the story. And it asks a ton of questions. Do you want this to happen? Do you want that to happen? What do you think about this? What does your main character think about that? So on and so forth. And it asks all these questions and it's supposed to trigger your creativity. And you're supposed to use that then to write down on the card um, what is going to happen in that portion of the story. You move on to the next card. You want to use it? Great, use it. If you don't use it, toss it out the window. Remember, and for so, every card you don't use, that's wasted money, though. So use them all. <laughs> best deal. Best bang for your buck. I thought if you threw one out, you had to draw two. Or 
No, that's P-Knuckle. Never mind. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no. P-Knuckle. No one knows what that is anymore. Come on, all, old All man. three of us are from Indiana. We all know what P-Knuckle is. I've heard of P-Knuckle. <laughs> My grandmother played it. But I'm going to leave it at that. So yeah, it, it's it, it as you say, it's it's uh, you know the idea is this is not how this is not how to write a good story, it's not, and it's 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 loose enough that not only is this not going to tell you how to write a good novel, it's not just for novels. It's like you know this is <clears throat> this is the kind of narrative structure that you see in good good role playing game campaign. You see this narrative structure in graphic novels. You see this structure not just in an individual television episode, but across a season arc or across an entire show arc. Um, and so the idea was to try and create something that kind of fit all of those, all of those different use cases. And I like how you uh, gave the optional steps as well uh, in several of the acts to go ahead and build upon what you've already done. I thought that was a nice touch. A lot of people might have said, well, you know, this, this is the bare bones structure. I think you took the extra step to go ahead and show. And don't forget, you know, it's kind of like when you do a, an adventure and it's like, well, you can go this way or this way. Oh. You're going to end up here. But how you structure it uh, this right. way is really well. Now, why did you go with just the four acts? So, yeah, I mean... That was that was actually the probably the hardest part was that again everybody has a system, you know there are folks whose only job in Hollywood is to basically do script reviews and to look at a given script from a structural perspective and to fix those structural problems and a lot of them you know use some of the same systems or have their own system and I just started looking at every story structure. Theory and or a system I could get my hands on, and I got to a point where <coughs> every new system I come across, I'd be like, okay, yeah, that's you know that's in this other system that's that, and that system that matches with that, and oh, that's an interesting way of looking at that, but that's still you know, and what I discovered was that um, there are there are commonalities amongst all these story structure systems, and the Act Three Act Four thing is a common breakdown. Um, you know, everybody learns act three in English class and a lot of, a lot of writers still use this three act concept. Four acts is nothing more than the act three structure with act two split in half. So a lot of people, when they, when they talk about the classic act three structure, act one in, in the movie world is 25% of the movie. Act two is 50% of the movie and has at its very center, a turning point and act three is 25% of the movie. And so I, you know, there are some four act structures out there that basically, you know, are like, look, the beginning of act two is distinctly different usually than the second part of act two. So why don't we just split it? And so that's how we ended up with that four act story structure. I, I like the two and the three being similar uh, or common, uh, but giving you the freedom of go ahead and uh, moving it off. Now, I I don't want to write a novel, uh, but of course I, I do write a game or two now and again. And uh, I always like, uh, when I try and publish a scenario, I try and give the DM the option of, okay, your players are going to be jerks. So, you know, you may have to uh, improvise and here's a good improvisational point. And that's what I like about you splitting two and three uh, apart. What was that, Kyle? I said, I'm hurt. Jerks, really? They could be wonderful players. Maybe you should tell them what to do if they're wonderful, like me. I, I have yet to uh, encounter any wonderful players, so I'm uh, I'm at a total loss there. Uh, Kyle, what did you think about the uh, four act system? Uh, no, I was just watching Avengers uh, and the End Game, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> this is exactly that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have a nine year old. I have to watch all the movies. Right? Nine yes, the nine times. the nine year old wanted to watch Avengers. <laughs> Got <Sure>. it. <laughs> yeah. Oh snap. <laughs> I'm sorry for those at home. That was the producer 
slamming Frank down. <laughs> Shit. You like the smell of that, Frank? Yeah, no, nobody could nobody could hear it, so I'm safe with that. Uh, <laughs> but, so, did you like the split on two and three, or is it just me? Uh, no, I think it was uh, perfect. I mean, if you go with the, um, let's say anime, the Naruto or whatever format, I definitely see that. Where at the beginning you introduced to sasuke's older brother or something like that and i'm sorry for all those not anime fans gonna go, get, a, go get some popcorn the opposing something. force eh, i read it opposing force early on and then they disappear for a while and the characters have fun they grow they have these victories but then yeah something terrible happens and it's like oh this is the perfect place to split it i thought act four acts was perfect I mean, when I got to Act 3, I was incredibly depressed and just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this, this is awful. <laughs> you cried, no, didn't no, you? you cried I a did, bit. a little bit. I was just like, man. I, <laughs> when I got to the Act 3 optional cards, I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly how I would <laughs> react. <laughs> you got to win at all costs. You fall into despair. You said, eh, we're going to fight it to the death, and if I die, who cares? It's like, oh, dang. Yeah, okay. No, I, I was going to say these cards, other than the fact that they are written in Latin, and I'm American, and I speak English, <laughs> you'll have to fix that in the uh, fix up there. <laughs> I, too, grew up on the south side of 40. <laughs> now, now, to be fair... Uh, if you've ever watched any of Kyle's shows, they drone on. So Kyle has like 11 acts in his. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I just like to really enjoy that second act. It's such yes. a freeing, that, fun yes. place. Yes, that is, that is, it's funny. There's actually a story structure system, I forget which one it is, that actually calls act two the fun and game section of the story. I Bam, see. see that? I don't have yep. none of that higher education. <laughs> Scott, take a drink because I made a good point. <laughs> Scott, Scott was almost going to be on here for this one. Uh, I know I saw it. I as soon as you say that. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and hit the main points of each act. Now, remember, folks, uh, if you pick this up. It's 55 pages, so there's a lot of heft to it. There's a lot well, of valuable To be ideas. fair, it's this page and then the heft. <laughs> well, yeah, but, I mean, if you start losing it because your kids are watching the Avengers and you're It's a really good stuff, movie. I cry when he's like, Avengers Assemble, man. It's like, I knew it was coming, but, man, the music was on point. I think they should have benched Rudy, period. Okay? Unfavorable opinion. <laughs> so, you don't talk uh, about Han asking like that. He's a goonie, damn it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead and just hit some of the main points in each act, Mike. Uh, because if you want, I, I mean, there are a plethora of ideas here. Uh, and there is no way, even if he wasn't DMing in a little bit, that he could cover them all uh, within the timeline. Not even of a, a Kyle show timeline. I mean. <laughs> that, that is accurate, yes. Uh, so uh, let's start with Act 1. Mike, what's, what's your favorite part of Act 1? Yeah, so um, just, you know, before I start in on the acts, just wanted to say that, like, you know, a big, a, a lot of this comes from um, kind of the, the, the way, frankly, Lord of the Rings was written. You know, a, a lot of the story structure uh, methodologies, you know, really boil down to how was Star Wars written and how was Lord of the Rings written? And I mean the novel, not the, not the movie. And uh, there was a movie. And, yeah, I know. <laughs> and so um, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, again, you have to look at the whole system from a extremely like kind of abstract perspective. If you took like a movie about a lady who, you know, essentially lost her, uh, you know, her nail salon due to like bad taxes, you actually would still use the same like story structure. Um, as you would use for writing like an world ending, you know, asteroid crashing into the earth kind of movie. So it really, the whole point is that kind of drama can, can, can exist on like this continuum of, of, 
of uh, scale. Like it could be really small drama, but it's still dramatic, right? And it could be really big drama. And it also, you know, and I hope, I don't know, I, I could use some feedback on this. It still also works for, you know, things that I consider to be comedies, you know, romances, other things as well. I don't write those things. So I am more than happy to take feedback from anybody who does. Um, so yeah. What? I think those movies would be a really good one to watch to see if they do work for those. Yeah. I mean, you I, had like what, seven scary movies? Just watch all of those. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure they followed, but they had the date movie, uh, superhero I'm movie. Porkies in this. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a colossal mess. <laughs> Keep going, Mike. Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, Act One. Act One is basically. Um, you know, it's got a couple. It's got a couple of key points. Uh, your, you know, who's your main character? Who, who's who, who, whose perspective am I, the reader, following or the or whatever? Um, whose perspective am I following through this through this story? Like, and what is it about them that makes me actually give a shit about what you know they're doing? Um, and then you've got to basically kick them in the nuts. Um, so you take your main character and you do something horrible to them and you present them with a problem. And again, it could be anything from like, you know, asteroids who destroy the earth. Um, oh, by the way, I have the, you know, the one ring, you know, in my pocket. Um, or it could be, you know, again, I just lost my nail salon or, you know, my grandmother's dying and I have three days to get to her bedside in order to say, you know, goodbye. It, whatever it is, something happens that basically gives that main character a problem, right? And that problem is essentially the cornerstone of the rest of the story. And this is where it's actually really helpful for folks like who are writing for the first time, because a lot of times you can get lost in your own story. And when you get lost in your own story, you start to think, well, wait a minute, where am I going? Like, you know, I can follow my character as he randomly does things from day to day but you start to lose track of what the sort of core point of the story is. And so act one is where you set that core point. You basically are like, this is the problem we're solving. Act two, of course, my personal favorite, bring in the pain. <laughs> Ratcheting up the tension, I believe is how you yep. put it. Uh, yep. And that uh, is exactly it. Uh, because once you've introduced the problem, hey, we got to get the ring to Mordor. Hey, uh, tax men are bad, and I have to go say goodbye to Grandma, so she'll give me a million dollar check. Uh, there be your problem. Next is the problems that you face doing it, uh, right. and and you have split up two and three nicely with bringing the pain and bringing the tension. Uh, go ahead and discuss that one for me, please. Yeah. So two again is you know. <laughs> You, you, almost all stories um, with occasional exceptions tend to be about ordinary folks who do extraordinary things, right? Or who are put into an extraordinary circumstance and asked to rise to the occasion. And of course, tragedy is when they fail to do that. Um, but like, you know, even in stories where, you know, your main character is just amazeballs from the beginning, like a lot of your, some of your superhero stories are that way. Um, you've got to take them out of their, you got to take them out of their comfort zone, which is what's what you first see in act one. And you got to stick them someplace new. You got to stick them in some sort of circumstance or place that is out of the ordinary for them. Um, so, you know, act two, or, you know, if, if you're three act structure, it's act two, part one, act two is you doing things that have you test yourself against this new interesting problem or world that you're now in, right? Um, and then it usually results in some wins, some losses. Typically there's some kind of growth, like, you know, there some things are happening um, that improve you, but all attempts at solving that core story problem from act one, don't quite, don't quite do it, right? You're not, you're not getting there. You're not, you know, getting to where you need to be. And, at the midpoint of the story, especially if you listen to all the Hollywood types, there is this massive sort of reversal of fortune. And act two ends with you thinking, eh, I think I've got this. And then act three tends to begin with, 
No. Um, you know, different story. This is where, you know, some of the story structure, you know, tends to, to fall apart. You know, some people have different opinions on how to do this, but a lot of them boil down to, you know, act three is when either the core story problem turns out to be either different than you thought it was. So, you know, kind of a planes, trains, and automobiles, you get a halfway through the story and suddenly it's a different story. Um, or the, it's significantly harder than you thought it was going to be. Well, you know, Frodo gets as far, you know, in the party, get as far as, you know, um, the falls of Raros. And then Frodo realizes it's, you know, the ring is, is essentially um, going to drive his friends mad and he needs to run away and basically do the rest of it by himself. Um, or, so or those aren't pillows. <laughs> if you haven't seen planes trains and automobiles you gotta watch it to get that joke <laughs> yep. i man it's been so long okay yeah so um so yeah so then and that's where act three kind of comes into play and act three really boils down to you know even if even if it's comedy even if this is like some kind of you know um uh, like a romantic comedy or something like that, that, that I'm not particularly familiar with as an art form. <laughs> um, you know, this is the part of the story where, where stuff goes bad and typically you put a lot of pressure and you put a lot of, of, you put a lot of strife, you put a lot of, you, you know, almost near impossible obstacles for your, your main character to overcome. And a lot of act three tends to be that main character getting beaten down to a certain degree. Um, and the reason you beat down your main character is because in most stories, there is something about your main character that needs to change in order for them to essentially be able to complete the story successfully. Um, and again, you got to take this stuff super abstractly. You can't just, you know, Oh, I'm in act three. Now my character is going to discover that like, you know, he's, you know, half elf, you know? And so now he has the power of this and you, you, you've got it. You got to like put a little more creativity to it in that. But what matters is that something happens that breaks that character down to a point where they are willing to either accept some kind of change or accept some kind of truth or accept some kind of, of um, challenge or in some way undergo some kind of change. And in, in fact, in, in like uh, Joseph Campbell, they call this the, the, the metamorphosis. So basically the, um, the, the main, something happens that transforms that character into somebody who can essentially finish this, finish the story out. And as a result of that, there's usually some kind of, again, this comes from Joseph Campbell, there's what's called a boon, right? Um, a boon is basically the thing that you suffered through act three to get. And the boon, if used correctly, and it's not always a thing, a lot of times it's information, a lot of times it's confidence, a lot of times it's something else. Um, this boon is what lets you walk into the final attempt at solving the core story problem um, and potentially have a chance of winning. Now, whether you win or lose is going to be up to you as the writer, right? And so act four tends to be about, you know, um, what happens, right? That's if you're wrapping up all your storylines. Um, you're determining whether your main character does succeed in the end. Um, or do they succeed and die as, as you know, in, in certain dramatic uh, ways? Do they fail? Um, is this a tragedy? And so, and yeah, so act four. And then of course you wrap the whole thing up with, you know, without like, you know, adding 20 minutes on the end of your movie, um, you, you at least show your audience what some of the consequences are of your, your, your uh, main character's success or failure. And these examples that you've been using are all part of your optional techniques in each one of these acts correct yeah a lot a lot of the a lot of the optional cards that you that you add there that you're a lot that you can add to your to your story really kind of dive into 
um, common, there are common patterns that I see over and over again in movies or common patterns I see over and over again in novels um, or graphic novels or, or, or uh, even role-playing game campaigns or even, you know, CRPGs. Um, a lot of those are tropes that are used fairly often. Um, and again, the trick in order to make your stuff not formulaic is don't take it literally. You know, if you're going to use a trope that says, you know, my character dies in the end, you know, make it interesting. Come up with an interesting way that your character's death, you know, maybe it was required in order for, you know, the aliens to not take over the earth, something like that. No one likes the Assassin's Creed 3 ending. No. <laughs> See, also, all the pictures. I was, I was thinking Matrix. Oh, but yeah. Yeah, Matrix, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Matrix is an excellent example there. Ooh, way to jump the <laughs> shark into its mouth. <laughs> Let's make one more movie. Uh, yeah, I, and I like that. And I, judging from the optional cards, I look at it, and please correct me if I'm mistaken, as if I want to intertwine a secondary story those are the cards that you really want to use because you've got the overall campaign arc or story arc that you want to go with. And when you use the formulated optional cards, it goes ahead and gives another layer or two for the story. Yeah, that's definitely, yeah, that's definitely true. You can, you know, you can make those cards work with your main character or you can make them work as side stories. Um, Stepping past the the story, um, the, the the story engine for just a second. So this product that you know is the story engine. Um, there are two of the products that are currently in development um, and or testing called the character engine and the plot engine. Uh, working titles, and the character engine. One of the things that it does is it actually adds another type of card that we call a roll card, and roll cards are like enemy, uh, shapeshifter, um, uh, love interest, buddy, um, paragon. Th these are all common roles that other characters play in your story. Um, you can, you can, again, going back to formulaic writing, you can sometimes make characters too one dimensional by focusing on what their role is in a story. But the idea behind these cards is to say, okay, the story, the story adventure, or sorry, the story adventure, the story engine is really the main character story. But I never, I personally never write stories with a single main character. I always have two to three main characters and their stories do this. That's just my particular style. So in that particular case, the, um, I actually, would take maybe a couple of different print ups of the printouts of the of the story engine and i would do one for each main character and then it from the character uh from the, the uh character engine cards the role cards are like your secondary important characters and what role they play so you know in act three this you know this person's the love interest of the main character how does that impact, you know, act three? I'll put those notes on that particular card. And then I, after doing that, I might go back to my main character's third act cards and write a note or two about how this character interacts with them or something like that. So, yeah. Now, if you were using this product for say, television development, a sitcom, uh, a drama, something like that, I would think that what you just mentioned would be, uh, you know, let's take, uh, let's take Friends. There's always two or three stories going on in the half hour episode. And that's how, that's how I was, when I was reading through it, that's how I was envisioning what the potential for that is. Am I off the mark or close or? No. And, and again, this was, this was created as much for, for sort of mo more modern media. And I think of television actually as being more modern uh, media than film, because I think we're kind of in a golden age of television to a certain degree now. Um, and that kind of 
allowing yourself to hop back and forth from, you know, so you have your A story, your B story, your C story. That's what they, that's what they taught us in screen screenwriting. Um, and ha- you know, if you're, if you're doing something like that with the sh- shine cars, I can talk, um, you can have, you know, your A story, your B story, your C story on each card and how each of those cards interact with the arc or, or, Buy three each, copies of the Shine system and put A, B, and C on there. You, you know, I'm not making you do that. If, it's a PDF. You can print it out more than once, I promise. <laughs> no, but like, or you could you can mix it up, right? So you can have a character that sort of is, you know, the A story character is following that sort of Shine, you know, outline. Um, and then you can just bring in your B story and your C story to accentuate this particular piece. So in act two, you know, you're in a situation where someone says, I need a plan, which is one of the cards and, you know, formula formulating that plan and not just randomly striking out at the core story problem is that's one of the cards. And that could be a B story where the, you know, the, you know, a story, the, the, the character is like just trying to solve this problem. He doesn't really know what he's doing. And, you know, one of the characters could be like, okay, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. I'm going to go and I'm going to go do this thing. And I've got this plan. You put his story in on that card. And that way you can sort of layer your A, B, and C stories to have different functions within the the story arc. Very good. Kyle, rebuttal. Because remember, if we make him (laughs) mad, he promised to take it out on his players here in a few minutes. That's true. (laughs) true. I can do that. Don't worry. No, shit. I'm actually, I'm, I'm the lame duck tonight because I'm actually interested in what he has to say. I don't oh, have thanks, many, Kyle. Many, I, I, I appreciate you being cool. interested in the shit I spew out. That's nice. <laughs> well, not your shit. Huh? Yeah, you're asking decent questions, and I, I appreciate that. I don't know. I did have a list of things, but oh, honestly, uh, it was all wrapped up, and as I went through taking notes of it, I was immediately like, oh, yeah, no, this is exactly where I use it. And All right, guys, this is a D&D show. Dungeons Dragons role playing games. Yep, yep. How am I using this system exactly in that? And honestly, one of my first ideas, and I'll have you guys elaborate how you would use it, but let's talk about these module books, which have an outline but no story whatsoever. Yeah. There's bits and pieces of it, but it's like, oh, your players are going to go here, then they're going to go here, then they're going to go here. Yep. And it's like, yeah, pull out your shine story. You have the main characters, have them answer some questions, and yeah. we're going to enhance this, and we're going to make it their own. And that's honestly the thing that really jumped out at me, but how are you guys using it? Uh, I mean, Mike, how are you using this? To Yeah, work? so it's funny you mentioned that, because I actually just ran Dragon Heist for my uh, for my teen group. I Up until recently, I mostly GM for kids, and I had a teen group, and we ran Dragon Heist, and I, it was, as you said, it's just like, they go here, then they go here, then they go here, then they go here. I'm just like, okay, no character development, no, like, you know. So we had all these weirdo side stories going on um, where, you know, each One of, the of them had their shop closed by the IRS because they didn't pay the taxes. <laughs> um, and, you know, they, they it, and that's, that's how I would, that's how I would use it um, well, actually, no, that's not how I would use it. I, I, you can use some of the principles from Shine um, to kind of add to that kind of, like, you know, I had a, a, a Pathfinder game going with my family that... Um, well, that, stop the clock. 45 minutes. Pathfinder has been mentioned. That's a, uh, that's yeah. a, right. that's a Carol joke. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. If, if oh, no, enough. you're fine. No, but, um, and so, you know, it was one of those things where like, you know, it was an interesting story and all, but, you know, they wanted to, they wanted, I think they wanted something a little bit more than what was just happening in the, you know, the pre-made, you know, uh, adventure. And so using some of these principles, you can create story arcs of your own. Um, how I would specifically use this for, uh, for a game master, and this actually leads into a future prod- product, which I will talk a little bit about um 
We're getting him to spill all his secrets. It's the exclusive yeah. of the year. I don't know about that. Sorry, go ahead. Um, it is, you know, essentially when you're creating that, when you're starting a new campaign, that's when something like this, I think, really is useful to me personally. So if you're starting a new campaign, um, your, you know, the sky's the limit. You know, you you have a whole world to create. You have a whole story to tell. And it's interesting to me, as long as you're willing to remember that after every play session, you're going to have to go back and trash half of it and rewrite it because your players are jerks, um, then, you know, as long as you're willing to accept that, you can actually use this uh, very much for creating uh, campaigns. Having said that, um, the future product is, 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 is the working title um, is the Lucerne Campaign Engine. So it is literally a, re, it's, it's, it's essentially started out as a copy of Shine and has been completely sort of rewritten and reformulated with role-playing game campaigns in mind. Um, and in it, I've got some guidelines on how to write an outline for a campaign without getting into, this is what the main characters do. You don't get to choose that. You're the game master. You don't get to choose that. You only get to choose the pain that you can throw at them, right? And so it, 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 it's, it's, it's an attempt. And what it's kind of cardinal attempted. sin is this crap? <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it's an attempt to solve that sort of problem of how do you outline something where your characters theoretically have free will, right? Oh. Um, <laughs> Malarkey. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you said theoretically. I know it's a big exactly. word. But <laughs> I, I, it, it's still in test, okay? It's still in test. But basically it boils down to, you know, when you're writing, when you're writing Shine, you're basically creating what are called story beats, right? A story beat is just a snippet of story. Like, this is what happens, and this is what happens, and this is how they felt about it. Those story beats in the, in the role-playing world turn into, um, I call them events and adventure opportunities. So an event is something that happens outside the player's control. That is like, you know, the player's number one um, ally um, against the Megacorp is assassinated and they no longer have a, a method of getting contracts from this particular, like, you know, Megacorp. Um, a adventure opportunity is, um, a, you know, a leak is given to the players um, that, you know, one of the, you know, Neo Los Angeles uh, police detectives um, is investigating them and might be willing to talk to them. So when you're writing you, that when you're writing out that outline of your campaign, you're focusing on those two things, you know, what happens no matter what, and that will help guide your players down that certain path um, there, you know, especially if you write really epic campaigns where events tend to push your players in certain directions. Um, that's important for that. And then of course, adventure opportunities are where your players can make choices to be like, okay, you know what, we're going to go do this thing. So I like that. But, okay. uh, now, would you think about still using the Shine story for your NPCs in that situation where maybe you do have the big bad evil guy is the hero of your story in this case. And so while your main characters are running around doing what they will and causing the tension for the big bad mm -hmm. evil guy, and then you, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I mean, you absolutely. Out loud. You no, you absolutely could, and and the, as long as as long as you leave enough room in the the sort of the outline for your 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 evil bad storyline, mm -hmm. as long as you leave room for the players occasionally like you know stepping on his toys, and uh, as long as as long as you have that kind of wiggle room, then yeah, that absolutely would work. That's not that's actually that's a really good idea. Every once in a while, Drink you again, <laughs> Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I, I like that. Now, uh, we're starting to run low on time because I know you got your game. Um, so Shine Story Engine is available right now. Uh, low, low price, 10 bucks. Uh, and how long does that sale go? It's just for, you know, during NaNoWriMo, so just for the month of November. Upside down. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, 
So definitely go to oddfishgames.com. Uh, take a look at it. Uh, we each got our copy. We're liking it. Uh, let's go ahead and do a, just a brief overview because I know you're, you're getting ready to go. Uh, tell us, uh, well, you've already talked about Adventure Sense. Uh, mm-hmm. Big fan, huge fan. Uh, let's talk about Cooking with Dice. Yeah, Cooking with Dice uh, was my wife's first role-playing game. And it's basically it's it's basically adventures in the kitchen. So the idea is there's a little, there's kind of a story. Um, and as you're sort of going through this story, um, your adventure is to actually take a, an actual recipe. And it's not a recipe, and I'll explain that in a second, um, and cook it. Um, and you know, you kind of progress through increasingly difficult um, uh, recipes, but they're not actually recipes. What they are, they're more like formulas. And when you, each, each of these formulas gives you a basic, um, a basic food or drink that you're making, and then you actually have random roll tables for the ingredients. And you can end up with some bizarre combinations but one of the fun things uh you know when it came to testing this besides like running up our grocery budget budget was that uh you could get some combinations that you never would have guessed worked in terms of food and so i don't know it's a lot of fun it's it's definitely something that's fun to do with kids it's definitely something that's fun to do to throw a weird wrench into a role-playing game where one day like my wife was running my wife was running a, a game for some, some of the kids in the neighborhood and uh, they actually routinely did that. They would go to the kitchen and the kids as part of their adventure would, would actually cook something. It was a lot of fun. So that's, that's cooking with dice. Um, upcoming soon, we have how to RPG with your cat, which is, you know, you take, uh, you know, cats are already like furry little balls of chaos. So um, you They're can like play. Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> you, you basically take your cat and, you know, whatever type of check you're supposed to be doing, you can combine this with whatever role-playing game you're playing. You could have the cat be a character, or you could just use your cat as dice. Um, whatever type of check you're doing, you have a prompt where, like, I don't know, I, I can't think of any prompts off the top of my head, but the prompt could be, you know, put something near the cat, and based upon what the cat does in response... Um, and all of these are like, you know, kind of cat tropes. They're like things that cats do, you know, depending upon the cat's response, that's what the character does. So instead of dice, you have a cat. So that's, that's, that's our, that's our new other new product that's coming out here shortly. Now to get ahead, instead of using weighted dice, what you use is catnip. And that's <laughs> how you get the. And, and these... It's amazing. <laughs> and these are not tabaxi, right? So Carol could Carol conceivably like be interested in this. She's a noted tabaxi racist, despite her denials. Uh, now, you have had that uh, on uh, uh, several Sundays here. Uh, we've pushed it. Do you have a date for your next one yet? or still um, I think open? we're running one in December, but I don't have the date on me. I think not it's still being decided. Yep. Well, when you do, let us know, and we will go ahead and get that posted, uh, folks. We've uh, we've eaten up most of the hour, uh, as we always do. Uh, this has been Mike with OddFishGames.com. Uh, we'll go ahead and post the notice, but it's at OddFishGames.com. Uh, you can pick up any of the aforementioned products there. Again, huge fan of Adventure Sense, but if you got kids, don't let them eat it. <laughs> Bad. Very it bad. was only one time, and I'm sorry I missed the campaign to take him to the hospital. Strangely enough, they did go into like a little ball, and it came out all at once. That was a godsend, honestly. For legal purposes, uh, he just hit his kid, so it was he was not trying to poison his child at all. Uh, doorknob. It was a doorknob. Sure, we'll go with that. He fell into the doorknob. Uh, Mike, go ahead and wrap us up uh, with uh, some of your final thoughts on this and any information you'd like to share with the viewers. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, I appreciate you guys having me on here. Um, you know, again, we make uh, Oddfish Games is basically a tiny little company that makes oddball products. Whatever comes into our weird little heads, we you know we get some of our friends to help us test it out and and see if it's something that anybody else might like and uh, catch us at conventions. If we ever have conventions again, 
um, particularly Gen Con and Origins. We're always and, there with the table. And Hoosier Con. And Hoosier Con. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Kyle has an idea that he wants to pitch to you, but we're going to do that way off camera. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, hey. Because it, it is. I already I'll put it publicly know. in the chat. It's <laughs> <laughs> it is highly offensive uh folks has been between the roles follow us on twitch follow us on twitter take a look at our youtube archive uh if you want to shoot the shit with us hit us up on the discord channel most importantly uh not our stuff but if you want to be here like mike or if you want to play in a one shot maybe mike wants to do that uh m hobo inc twitter or gmail hit us up we'll get you in there now this week uh we've got cacophony on thursday i think they're going to go after a musical instrument uh saturday is the campaign for the love of god i hope they wrap it up or die uh sunday is the tri-generational game uh we're slowly but surely getting back on track here uh in december we are going to have new games we're going to have uh, a Pathfinder for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, game. Uh, Scott is We're going, going to... through the ghosts of D and D path. <laughs> Woo! Scott's doing a Marley mission, and uh, Caitlin is going to do Blue Rose, uh, a game hmm. that none of us are familiar with, but it is a romantic thing. So I think I'm going to fall in love with the unicorn uh, sensually. I think. Uh, don't forget, uh, take a look at oddfishgames.com. Pick up some adventure sense. Uh, not putrid sewers. That's sewers. a Kyle thing. Get the sewers. Uh, get to Rowdy Tavern. I like Rowdy Tavern. Uh, Elven Glade, I think, or Mage's Tower. Those are kind of cool. Uh, but for all of us here at Murder Hobo Inc., thanks for joining us, and we will see you on Thursday in Cacophony. Everybody wave. Do the, do the princess wave. That's what I'm going to do for Caitlin's game.